I think the profound poet G talked about change. And our story is really about change, uh, about an ordinary teacher, an ordinary teacher who had an extraordinary experience with 150 students, students who hated reading, students who hated writing, and most importantly, they hated me, this perky, annoying teacher wearing polka dots and pearls who walked into their class and wanted to give them a voice. And they looked at me and they sized me up with my white polka dots and my white pearls and this perceived white privilege, and they were miserable. And they made it their sole mission to make me as miserable as they were. Because when they sized me up and down, they thought there's no way in the world that this woman from, from Newport Beach can understand in the pit of her stomach what it feels like to be hungry. She probably has 500 pairs of shoes. She probably drives a brand new car. She obviously doesn't come from where we come from. And my student stereotypes obviously don't take into account that teachers don't make any money. But to their credit, I decided that I wanted to give my students an opportunity. And in walked on that very first day, that fateful day, a young girl. And she was not carrying a shiny red apple like my father had predicted before I made that 45 minute commute to school. Instead, at the age of 14, a ninth grader, she walked into my classroom with an ankle monitor around her leg and a probation officer. I looked at her sitting in the back of my classroom, throwing up her gang signs, carving her initials on a desk, and I realized that this young girl had never read a book from cover to cover, nor did she intend to. And so when I decided that I would give my students a voice, specifically her, and, and gave her a journal, I remember picking up the journal after that first writing assignment, and she simply wrote, I hate Aaron Gruel, I hate Aaron Gruel, and if I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her. Well, I grew up in suburbia. I didn't even know what shanking was. I just knew it wasn't good. <laughs> so I decided to give her an opportunity to tell her story, to stand in front of a room full of her so-called enemies, and to tell her story. And it began at the tragic age of five. And when you think of five years old, you think of kids going off to kindergarten with hopes and dreams and learning ABCs and one, two, threes. But by the time this little girl was five years old, she'd already been to more funerals than birthday parties. And she took us back to a moment, a moment in time when she was standing at a bus stop, hoping she could go off and, and learn those ABCs and one, two, threes and be an American dream, a dream that her family never actualized. How could they? They were poor. They were immigrants. And her father had these illusions of grandeur at the age of 11 that he was going to be a professional boxer, the next Muhammad Ali. But rather than join that local gym, at the age of 11, he joined that local gang. And for the rest of her childhood, was in and out of jail cells. Maria went on to tell us, this class wrapped with attention, that her mother was only seven years old and in second grade when she dropped out of school, at home taking care of brothers and sisters. By the time she was 15, she was pregnant. And by the time she was in her early 20s, she had three little babies, a tiny one-bedroom apartment, and a husband that was in and out of the slammer. And so at the age of five, Maria watched her mother get up at the crack of dawn and go and clean these big, beautiful homes in these fancy communities, big, beautiful homes that she realized, even at the age of five, were never going to live in. And then she would watch her mom go off to these big, fancy hotels and scrub toilets, big, fa fancy hotels she realized were never going to stay in. And then she would watch her mom work her fingers to the bones in these sweatshops down in East LA, wearing beautiful clothes, realizing my mama is never gonna wear those clothes. So at the age of five, armed with a box of crayons and these hopes and dreams, Marie was gonna go to kindergarten. And as she was standing at that bus stop with the weight of the world on her shoulders, she saw her cousin. And her cousin was this Superman, this, this robot, this, this person that could come in and swoop in and make her feel safe. He could make her feel safe when her dad was in jail. He could heat up food in the microwave when her mom was working that third job. And he told her stories, stories about knights in shining armor, stories about little girls like Maria being whisked off on a white horse, stories that always ended with the good guy always makes it. So what Maria saw was somebody who was larger than life, her knight in shining armor. And then she saw something. She saw what he was wearing. It didn't even register to her. She could care less about those baggy pants, that shaved head, that wife beater t-shirt, those tattoos. And then she saw him get shot five times in the back. And as he was lying in a pool of blood, a pool of blood that looked like a melted cherry popsicle, Maria kept wondering and wishing, when is he going to jump up? Because that's what happens in cartoons and in fairy tales. The good guy always makes it. 
And yet at the age of five, Maria realized that sometimes, sometimes the good guy doesn't make it. And I wondered how this little girl had the courage to make her way off to kindergarten and try to learn those ABCs and those one, two, threes when she didn't even know what post-traumatic stress disorder was. But what she did know at the tender age of five was, I'm different. I look different and I talk different. And when I raise my hand, what comes out is a combination of English and Spanish, this Spanglish, and people are laughing at me. And she said the person who laughed the loudest and the longest on that very first day was a teacher, a woman with chalk in her hand at a chalkboard. So at the tender age of five, Maria learned her first valuable lesson in school, that it is easier to make people laugh with you than at you. It's easier to be a bully. It's easier to be a class clown. It is easier to be in on that joke. So Maria Reyes gave up on that teacher, gave up on that classroom, and gave up on education. And her father, ironically, became her teacher. He came home from Twin Towers Jail, and he bought his little girl a present she will never forget. And it wasn't a Barbie doll. It wasn't a book about green eggs and ham. It wasn't a bicycle with fringe on the handlebars. But he bought his five-year-old daughter these shiny red boxing gloves. And he told her with no uncertain terms that life is tough. And when it knocks you down, you better get back up swinging. So at the age of five, Maria learned how to swing first and to swing fast, how to keep a stiff upper lip, never show her weakness in public, never cry, because if she started, she may never stop. And most importantly, don't you rat or snitch on a homeboy. So when Maria Reyes watched her father get handcuffed again and taken off to maximum security prison, San Quentin, at that moment, that was her teacher. And she wanted to follow in his footsteps she could care less about those number two pencils, those standardized tests. She could care less about fancy schools like Yale. She cared about places like jail. And so by the time she was 11 years old and in sixth grade, Maria Reyes, just like her daddy and her granddaddy before that, got jumped into a gang. And by the time she walked into my classroom at the age of 14, she had already been to boot camp and a juvenile hall again and again and again. Well, I wanted to give Maria and 149 others an opportunity for a second chance, an opportunity to, to put down that fist, to put down that gun, to put down that spray can, and to pick up a pen. And maybe they couldn't change that cast of characters they were dealt, but maybe they could rewrite their story. Maybe they could rewrite their own ending. So I decided to have my students pick up a, a plastic champagne glass filled with sparkling apple cider. And starting right then, right now, it didn't matter that Maria had been kicked out of every school she ever attended. It didn't matter that she had a 0.5 GPA. Maybe she could pick up that plastic champagne glass filled with sparkling apple cider and talk about, for the first time in her life, reading a book from cover to cover. Not going to the internet and downloading somebody else's paper. Not getting the cliff notes. Not getting the movie at the video store. But picking up a book. A book written by and for and about a little girl a little girl in an attic who would look out her window and watch her friends being let off like sheep to slaughter. Well, when I gave Maria the opportunity to pick up that book and to rewrite her ending, at first it wasn't so easy. So she picked up that plastic champagne glass and she got very serious. And it wasn't about a book. It wasn't about that number two pencil. But she simply said, I don't want to be pregnant by the time I turn 15 like my mother. And I don't want to spend the rest of my life behind bars like my daddy. And I don't want to be six feet under by the time I turn 18 like my cousin. I want to change. So for a brief moment, I'd like to introduce you to Maria. I'd like to have the profound effect that a book and a little girl in an attic had on her. And I'd like to have a glimpse into the world of change, possibility, and promise. I think they got swept up in that moment not realizing that there was this academic component attached to it, which was, okay, now you have to read these books. And I think Maria, of, of all students, she was furious because I think she felt I had tricked her, that she was very excited about changing. She just didn't want to read a book to, to have to prove to me that she could change. She became the benchmark for reading this book because she truly did not want to read it. In her mind, Anne Frank was not Latina, Anne Frank did not come from the hood, Anne Frank did not speak Spanish. Anne Frank didn't live in Long Beach. I took the book and uh, I went home and um, I was still on house arrest, so it's not like I could go do other things. There's a picture in the front that looked all of, you know, 12. Uh, 
I looked at that picture and there was nothing that I could relate to. But with nothing else to do, uh, I opened this stupid book because in the back of my mind, I thought that I was going to prove Ms. Grow wrong. She would come back every day and she would ask questions about Anne kind of in, in, in juxtaposition to her gangster mentality. And, you know, if Marie was in a gang, then Anne Frank had to have a posse. You know, I revere my father, and Anne Frank reveres her father, and sometimes my mom drives me crazy, and so does Anne Frank's mom. So every day was this kind of ping pong, and, and based on her questions, and how they all had this like, kind of like gangster twist on it, I, I realized that like, she's actually reading. It started getting interesting when things started going bad. That's when I thought, okay, maybe she's not this spoiled little girl that I thought she was. Maybe she doesn't have a perfect little life. And that's actually when I took a liking to her. I came to the entry where she's describing this window, her only connection to the outside world. She couldn't even put her hand outside because one of the Gestapo or somebody would know that they were in hiding. And then this bird lands close to her, um, to the tree and outside the window. And she writes, um, Sometimes I feel like a bird in a cage and I wish I could fly away. I was able to relate to that feeling of knowing the outside world and only having this certain connection to it. And from then on, I knew she was going to make it. She had to make it. She was going to make it because why Ellsworth would be reading this book. And she's going to make it because she's a good person and she hasn't done anything wrong.